I want to take this time and introduce our keynote speaker for the day, who I'm very proud that he accepted the request to come to stock. He is the former mayor of Oakland, California. He is a former state assembly member. He is the former chancellor of the college. But more importantly, he's the champion for justice in the state of California. When we think of politicians, we don't always think of community activists. But in mayor, former mayor or assembly member, Ella Hugh Harris, that is exactly what he is. We served on the state NAACP executive committee together ch addressing challenges in the state of California. And he is our higher education chairperson. And there's nothing more important in the state of California than education of our children. So without any further ado, please give a round of applause as we bring forward Mr. LSU Harris. And he's also, he thinks he's better looking than me too. <laughs> Not over here, Elliot, Elliot. I'm coming up the wrong way. <laughs> See, we did have the podium up there, but we had to compromise video or podium up there. So, thank you, God. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I'm very happy to be here, to be here this evening. Uh, I want to thank Bobby and Lawana for inviting me to Stockton. Uh, Bobby called me a couple of weeks ago and said, uh, I want you to come and speak to the Freedom Front that are in Stockton. And I said, well, I'll come if I if can't find anybody else. I said, shut up, fool, you know I couldn't find anybody else so I wouldn't have called you. <laughs> I said, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I want you to talk about five minutes and sit down. <laughs> so I'm talking a little bit longer than that, but I I'm just really excited. You know, Stockton, when I was growing up, you know, Stockton was the country. And uh, the only reason you went to Stockton was the Highway 99 to go to Los Angeles. <laughs> I mean, it was really the country. So as I was driving down here tonight with my wife, I said, you know, it's really interesting. It's changed. I said, when I was a little boy, there was a two-lane highway coming to stop. And a very few cars. She said, what changed? I said, well, now they got four lanes and a lot more cars. <laughs> but you know, um, I can tell you that a lot of the history is stopped, particularly to those of us who've been involved in politics. And uh, you know, we used to look at people like Ralph White, just neighbors are always just amazed how they were able to survive and stop. And then I can tell you when uh, we had reapportionment in 1980, um, there was a congressman from Fresno who was having problems getting elected. His name was Rick Lane. And they developed something called the Stockton Lift. It went from Fresno all around the foothills into South Stockton. Now, after his first election, I ran to Rick Lehman. I said, how do you like Representative Stockton? He said, let me tell you something. He said, when Democrats die, they shouldn't go to heaven, they ought to go to stop, South Stockton. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are very interesting times. As we look at 2019, this is the 400th year of the first African enslaved people arriving in Jamestown, Virginia. And we've had 400 years of struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. And after 400 years, the struggle continues, and in some ways, it's gotten worse. You go back and think about what happened in all the slave rebellions. You think about what happened with people like Denmark Basin. You understand the people who sacrificed, like Nat Turner. And then you found out that because of their sacrifice, 
William Lloyd Garrison started the abolition movement in 1831. And then we saw a very significant decision, the Fugitive Slave Law, where the Supreme Court indicated something that I think uh, is very important. Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Roger Tanney said, black folks have no rights to white folks are bound to respect. Even after the 13th and 14th Amendment were passed, Supreme Court has never overturned that ruling. And there's still members of the state of the Supreme Court who still believe that ruling is the majority rule in America. So after the Civil War, we saw the uh, Compromise of 1877. That compromise I saw the end of Reconstruction. We saw the end of black elected officials in the South. We saw the 1896 decision of Plessy versus Ferguson that said separate and equal to stand in this country. But in 1905, we saw the Niagara Movement where people like W.B. Du Bois came together with others and said, we need to start an organization that will speak about freedom, that will speak about it in the South and the North. And out of that, in 1909, as you all know, we saw the birth of the NAACP, which was the first national civil rights organization that was really prepared to challenge the status quo of racial injustice in this country. And if you look at what goes on throughout the history of this country, it's always been about individuals being willing to stand up and fight regardless of the odds. The movie out now by Harriet Tubman. And that movie talks about a woman who after she got her own freedom went back to the South time and time again to free other slaves. She said something very important. She said, you know, she said, I freed a thousand slaves. She said, I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. We still got people in this country, black folks included, who don't understand that they still got a slave mind. You can't free yourself until your mind is free. If you don't know what freedom is, you won't fight for it. So we look at Harriet, and Harriet said something else that I just wanted to say, I think is very important. She said, every dream begins with a dreamer. She said that a dreamer is someone who has the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and be willing to change the world. And that's what we see in the founders of the NAACP, Monroe Twyla, W.B. Du Bois, and others, when they came together, they knew that without organization, we had no chance. There's no way you can want to fight if you're fighting by yourself. If you don't join with others of like mind and common spirit, passion, and courage, you will not achieve your goals. So today we are here to celebrate those who fought for our freedom and rededicate ourselves to that goal of freedom, justice, and equality. So we live in a, live in a country where the goal and the American dream of freedom, justice, and equality have been replaced by economic oppression and racism. And we don't understand sometimes when we see racism. Sometimes we are willing to look the other way. And there have been changes in demographics in California. You know, uh, a while back, 30 years ago, the uh, black population of Oakland was over 50% of the population in Oakland. Over the last 30 years, we've seen about a third of blacks in Oakland move towards uh, San Leandro and Haywood and Union City. Another third moved out this way toward Tracy and Stockton. Another third moved north toward Vallejo and Fairfield and Vacaville and Sacramento. If we move any farther east, we're going to be in Las Vegas and Reno. <laughs> You know, there was a movie that came out recently by Janet Glover, who's a good friend of mine. And that movie is called The Last Black Man in San Francisco. And when Willie Brown was mayor of San Francisco, 
uh, he gives, gives everybody black a bus ticket and a Section 8 voucher and told him to move it over. <laughs> and now the black population in San Francisco is about 5%. The black population in Oakland has dropped to about 25%. By 2030, it's projected to be down to 18%. You know, that, that outward migration is fine on one level for people looking for better homes. But if you ever see 580 coming west in the morning, you know, there are over 90,000 people who have, who every week come from this part of the Central Valley into the Bay Area, and 160,000 people in Sacramento. So we gotta make sure that we're not just fighting for housing, we gotta fight for jobs. You shouldn't have to drive that far to get a quality job. Forty percent of the people in this country make it fifteen dollars or less an hour. That's why people got two and three jobs. So when Donald Trump says we got full employment in America under my leadership, hell, we had full employment with slavery. That would have been good day either. <laughs> When Barack Obama got elected in 2008, and we were going to be living in a post-racial America, boy, were you confused? <laughs> we got the Antichrist in the White House, and you know there are some people who really like the Antichrist, but a lot of those people, unfortunately, are evangelicals, and I'm not having anything against evangelicals. But they're practicing religion, they're not playing practicing relationship with Christ. Because if they were, they would not endorse a misogynist, racist, sexist idiot. <laughs> there is nothing that you can say that is consistent with Christianity represented by Donald Trump. Because if Donald Trump was a Christian, I must be something else. <laughs> But the good thing about Donald Trump is he has reminded us, for those of us who thought we were free, who thought that we had nothing to fight for, who thought that things were going to be better and keep on getting that way without our involvement, I hope you know you were sadly mistaken. We got to keep on keeping on. We got to keep working. We got to keep struggling. We got to keep fighting. We got to keep working together. So I got a couple of things I want to tell you, I want to ask you to do, moving forward. Number one, I want you to continue to get an education. Don't just send your kids to school, go with them. Let the teacher know that you care about their education more than the teacher does. George McKinnon, a good friend of mine, is on the LA School Board, and he said something in Oakland a few years ago that I thought was very important. He got booed for it. You know what he said? There are more teachers who can't teach than students who can't learn. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with a great teacher. We need great teachers. Yeah. But I don't want you to tell me I'm supporting you because you're a teacher. I want you to prove to me you're a great teacher by educating my child. Yeah. Second thing, we have got to get involved. Get involved in your church. Get involved in the NAACP. And I don't care if you're not a Christian, because you know what? You need to be in church. Because if you don't believe in God, God still believes in you. <laughs> you know, there are too many people sitting at home on Sunday morning. If that's okay, but they watch football. They need to get up and have a moral comfort so they can get up on Monday and know what they got to be about, know what they got to do. If you know what you're doing, you know, that old adage, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Third thing, learn your history. Everybody needs to understand history. 
Those who don't learn from history, those who repeat it, we're repeating history right now. There are three books you need to read. First of all, you need to learn how to read. But let me tell you, those of you who can't read, don't be shamed, you can get out of it. Three books you should read. One is called Dark Money, a story about the Koch brothers and how they've been taking over America with right wing politics. In 1990, when I left the legislature, they sponsored a real, a, 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 what's it called, a term, a term limits edition. And you know why they sponsored it? So they could get Willie Brown out of the speakership. They put that money up, we didn't even know it at the time. Read and understand how that dark right wing corporate money can change the politics of America. Another book you should read, The Warmth of Other Sun. Learn about the migration of blacks out of the South to the West and the North. And what the struggle was then that led them out of the South, the struggle that led them East to West, and the struggle that continues. Because what happened in the South was, they didn't care how big you got as long as you didn't get too close. In the North, they didn't care how close you got as long as you didn't get too big. You know what's happening now? They don't want you to be big or close. In the North, the South, East, or the West. Because now economic oppression has taken over wherever racism, racism has left off. If they can keep you poor, they don't care where you live and you can't afford to live there. You know what's happening now in the, in the Bay Area? The median income for a house <coughs> in San Francisco is $300,000 a year. Shoot, I, I'm telling you, I told my wife, you gotta give me a, one of those RVs and just <coughs> so much like get out again. <laughs> the third book that I would like you to look at, if you have a chair, is The New Jim Crow. They replaced slavery with prison. And they said, you know what, you fill up those prisons with black folks, we'll all have jobs. Not for the young people of an open, the crime didn't pay. They said, you're a fool. I said, what do you mean I'm a fool? Crime doesn't pay? He said, yeah, it does pay the bailiff, the judge, the lawyers, the prison guards, the sheriff, everybody's making money off black folks in the jail. <coughs> and they put us in jail for the same crime the white folks got rehabilitation for. They had a different set of, of, of sentencing for those who used cocaine and those who used crack. In fact, those who used cocaine, they got treatment. Those who used crack went to jail for 20 years for nonviolent crime. We've got to rearrange the justice system. We've got to make sure that people understand restorative justice has got to be more than just a goal. It's got to be reality in California and around the world. We have really got to begin to understand that the control of our community lies in our hands. If we are willing to take control of our community, others will control our communities, our neighborhoods, and ultimately they will control us. Years ago, one of the more dynamic civil rights leaders was a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. And Fannie Lou Hamer told stories about a very wise, older black woman in a small town in Mississippi. And in that town, uh, that woman was known to be the wisest, the smartest woman anywhere in the South. And they said she could answer any question. She knew the answers to every question. So some young people said, you know what? The woman's not that smart. So we're going to show that she's not that smart. We're going to go out and see her. And we're going to hold a bird in our hand. And when we come up to her, we're going to say, Oh, well, lady, we got a bird in our hand. You're so smart, we want you to tell us. Is that bird alive or is it dead? They said, when she asked the question, she said, The bird is alive, we'll crush it in our hand. It will be dead. And she said, it's dead, we'll let it go and it'll fly out in the air. In either case, she'll be raw and we'll prove she's not that smart. So when they got up to the lady, they said, oh, lady, you're supposed to be so smart, we got a question for you. We got a bird in our hand. 
Is it alive or is it dead? She looked each of them in the eye. She said, young man, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. And that's what we've got to understand. The future of our community and our children is in our hands. There's a man named A.G. Gaston. A.G. Gaston was a poor guy who dropped out of school in the 10th grade. When he dropped out of school in the 10th grade, uh, he went to work in the mines. And when he went to work in the mines, he found that men were bringing their lunch and sometimes they forget their lunch. So he started selling the sandwiches for 25 cents a piece. He said when they didn't have any money, he loaned the money to buy the sandwiches and charge them 25% interest. <laughs> and then when those men started getting killed in the mines, their wives and widows would come and try to pay them a collection to pay for their funerals. And A.G. Gaston started a burial society called the Booker T. Washington Burial Society, which he later formed in the Booker T. Washington Life Insurance Company. After that, he got with his father-in-law and opened up a funeral home in Birmingham, Alabama. Then after that, when he found out there was no place for black folks to stay in Alabama, he started building motels. When he found out that there was nobody black to build a motel, he started a construction company. He kept doing that till he became one of the richest black men in America. So about 25, 30 years later, he had the occasion to speak at the commencement at Howard University. Now remember, this man dropped out of school in the 10th grade. As he was speaking to those Howard University graduates, he obviously split verbs. His grammar was terrible. He would say, I was happy to be here. I hope y'all know how pleased and honored I is to speak to y'all today. And the students start snickering because of his ignorance and inability to communicate clearly in the King's English. So in the middle of his speech, he stopped talking. He said, I know you guys are laughing because I don't have a great education. He said, but I want to ask you all each a question. He said, what would you rather be able to say? I am a millionaire, or I is a Howard graduate. <laughs> Understand. Just like A.G. Gaston, we've got to create jobs for our young people. They need to understand that there's opportunity. When you help them to go to school and get an education, there's got to be real work, real opportunity at the end of that educational window. We've got to show them that we will fight for them and they must fight for themselves. We've got to teach by example rather than teach them. We have to do what we've done and what our grandparents and forebears, forefathers did through the NAACP and our churches. We gotta organize, we gotta make sure the church is not a one day a week institution. And when we come to the NAACP Freedom Center, we gotta leave here as evangelists. There's no black person or even white, Asian, Latino, red, white, blue, pink, everybody needs to be in the NAACP. Without organization, without organization, we will slip back into the abyss. So I would tell you as that old lady told those young men in Mississippi, just as Martin Luther King told us in his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, it's in your hands. Thank you very much.
We ask him to come because he is a champion for justice. We ask him to come because he has put his money where his mouth is. We ask him to come because he stepped out there and he got beat up and beat down and he didn't run away or quit. He didn't hide, he didn't stop fighting, and he has been, even though he might be a little younger than me, I ain't sure, he been a mentor to me. And, but, but most importantly, he is a man of encouragement, he is a man of God, and he is a man of substance. And as long as we know that, and we honor that, and we respect that, and follow that, we can't help but to do great things in the city of Stockton. So we would like to give him a little token to take back to Oakland with him, so that they can see that in Stockton, we do know how to acknowledge folks that come from Oakland to Stockton. <laughs> Oakland via LA, because see, I'm from Southern California, so, you know, he and I, he, he and I are both uh, immigrants <laughs> to the north. <laughs> but at any rate, we have a appreciation, a, a, a plaque of appreciation presented to Mr. L. Hughes Harris for the keynote speaker in 2019. And thank you, God bless you, and I love you.